This should be a good one. I'm almost on first name terms with my UPS guy after this week. Lots of new stuff has arrived. We've got an AMD Epic 7402 CPU, a Supermicro H12 SSL-I motherboard, a Sliger CX4712 NAS chassis, a, a 4U rack mount NAS chassis, uh, an Intel Arc Pro A40 unobtainium graphics card that one of my podcast listeners sold me. Uh, we've got a U.2, we've got a couple of these, two terabyte Intel U.2 NVMe SSDs, uh, three, four terabyte Crucial MX500 SSDs for video editing over the network on ZFS, a bunch of three and a half inch spinning hard drives, it's a pair of 20 terabyte hard drives, but in the server just off camera, Morpheus, my old server, there are maybe seven, eight, can't quite remember. Seven or eight, maybe more hard drives in there ready to go. 256 gigs of DDR4 ECC memory clocked at 32 mega, mega transfers. <laughs> clocked at 3200 mega transfers per second. This is Samsung memory. And then for the boot drives, it's about as simple as it gets really. I've got a pair of one terabyte SATA two and a half inch SSDs and I've deliberately gone for different brands. I was doing my research over the weekend and found that these 870 EVO drives from Samsung have a little bit of a problem with their firmware or something. Never quite sure what to believe when you're researching things like that on the internet, but you never know. So I've kind of split the difference. I've gone for one Samsung one terabyte drive over here, coupled with one one terabyte Crucial two and a half inch SSD. And they're gonna run on the two orange SATA DOM ports down the bottom here on the Epic motherboard. Now this is a voyage into the unknown for me. I've never used any Sliger products before, but they did send this case over for review. No money changed hands, they just sent it over and said, here, take a look, let us know what you think. So here we go, we're gonna do just that. And boy, are we gonna put a beefy system into it today. So what have we got here with this case? We've got 10 slot loading, uh, three and a half inch drive bays on the front. This lovely sort of magnetic you know, front panel that just comes right off. I've asked them through email, I haven't had a reply yet, but I did only send it this morning. Um, can you get some kind of a filter for this front mesh? Because you can probably see, you know, it, it's quite porous, so there's any, any dust in the air is just going to get sucked right into the system. There are a couple of cases to compare this against in my mind. You've got the HL15 from 45 Drives, which I reviewed a month or two ago, along with the Rosewill LSV4500U, which is just out of camera over there. And it, what's interesting about this case is it comes in at about a $400 price point. For that, you get a full ATX, actually it supports eATX motherboards, a full 4U height, so you can use ATX size power supplies like this Seasonic Prime Gold I've got over here. And you don't get a pre-wired backplane, but what you do get in the box are these kind of, are these SATA to SAS adapters. So in the front here, you can fit 10 three and a half inch hard drives. They can be either SAS or SATA, depending on what you want to do. And then down the side over here, you just about see that in my B cam. Down the side over here, you can fit four more two and a half inch hard drives. But where it starts to get really interesting is you've got a pair of five and a quarter inch bays at the front here as well, like two CD ROM drive size. So I've bought this guy. This is an IC dock case and it's a six in one two and a half inch SATA uh, hard drive cage and it goes in one five and a quarter inch drive bay and it just has little spring loaded clips on the front here which pop out and you've got a little drive sled that your SSD will fit into and then it has pass through uh, SATA on the back with typical SATA power and a couple of probably noisy fans because they look small and cheap. This is just going to slide into the front here and give me space to mount six two and a half inch SSDs that I can hot swap out in and out the front as well as space for four more internally. So I'll put my boot SSDs at the front over there and then over here I'm going to put data ones. So this could potentially be useful for like offloading footage or something. Like I use a Ninja, uh, what's it called? A Ninja 5 Plus to do all the recordings for, for this channel and that's using a SATA SSD. So maybe I could offload footage that way. I probably won't, but I could. 
So things actually start to get quite interesting when we look inside the case at the fan wall in the middle. In my Rosewell case, I've completely removed that middle fan wall and just rely on the drive caddies, the four, uh, four three and a half inch drive caddies to pull, pull the air in from the front. And then I've got a couple of 80 mil fans at the back to suck air all the way through. And the middle of the chassis is kind of no man's land. But here, there is not space for front fans. And that's because it's a front loading trailer system for the hard drives. And there isn't really space on the sort of I'm going to call it a back plane, but I'm going to use inverted commas as I do it because it's sort of a pass through back plane. So it's still hot swappable drives, but you'll directly connect your cables to the back plane yourself manually rather than the 45 drives approach or even the uh, Rosewell approach where it's got a PCB available. Whereas this is literally just those, those adapters screwed into the metal. I, I didn't, I kind of found this out by mistake. I was messing about last night, just looking at this thing before I pressed record. And I discovered that the motherboard tray is removable. I have never had a case before that lets me do this. And I think it's the coolest feature in the world. Jeremy Clarkson would be pleased in the world. Now, if I pull this out, I can, I can literally take out the entire, once I clip a zip tie, there we are, zip tie clipped. Uh, I can take out this entire tray. So, oops. And this, this is, this is solid. Like some, some sheet metal can be really thin and flimsy, but I, I don't know if that comes across on camera, but that is solid, thick steel. And that ain't going nowhere. So this, this tray, as I say, supports uh, ATX all the way up to E-ATX motherboards. And it really is going to make my life installing all of this stuff much, much easier. I think it's one of those things that it's going to be useful for the, the next few minutes whilst I install the motherboard and things like that. And then after that, who knows? But uh, I guess time will be the judge on that one. That's a quick overview of the Sliger case itself. It's probably about time I put some of this hardware inside the case, right? So let's get on with it, shall we? This CPU cooler is the one that came with the motherboard and CPU and RAM combo that I bought on eBay. I wanted to just save anybody that buys this exact cooler just a few minutes of time. I thought to get in here to, to do up some of these screws, there are four screws to connect it into the socket, right? When, you, when you're actually mounting this thing. And to get to a couple of them, you have to take the fan off. And I started, you know, trying to reach my screwdriver in from the side like this, trying to uh, it was just it was just really annoying and then at the top here you actually can't physically get your screwdriver in well it turns out i'm stupid all you need to do is undo these two screws on the top and then just simply slide the whole fan assembly right off and it comes into two pieces and you get full access to all four screws to put it into the socket I'd say we're about halfway through the build now. The system is booted for the first time. Proxmox is installed. And now I'm looking to install all of the, all of the storage and things like that. And next up is this pair, are these pair of U.2 Intel NVMe SSDs. I've got one here that I've had since mid COVID at some point, a P4500 and one that I bought last week, a 4510, a P4510 Intel SSD. And what's cool about these is because I can now bifurcate my eight times PCIe slot, and I'll come onto the bifurcation stuff in a little bit, but essentially it means I can divide one of my PCIe slots up into two. Each of these things needs four PCIe lanes to operate properly. So I simply take this card, slot two of these SSDs into it, enable bifurcation in the BIOS, and I'll be off to the races. Right, so with all of that testing done, I think it's time to actually put this tray back in the case now. Tuck these cables out of the way. This is the first time I've ever actually been able to build a computer outside of the computer case and then just shove it in. I guess this is what the blade guys must feel like. You know, all, all nice and smug. Look at me with my blade server, I can just shove it into a slot. That's kind of what this is on a much less technically advanced level. <laughs> so it's nothing like that at all, is it? 
That was easy. I was expecting it to be really fiddly, especially with all the extra weight and stuff like that. So let's put the screws back in. Where would I put the screws? Kidding. I've got a little magnetic screw pad over here to my left. This uh, this little screw pad, by the way, you can go look on the B cam. This little screw pad came with a, a wow stick from, I, th I think recommended from Random Frank P, of all YouTubers. The screwdriver itself is terrible, honestly, but this little magnetic pad for screws is fabulous. I use it all the time for all sorts. It's just, it's just sticky enough that you can pick things up and move them around and they're, they'll mostly stay put. It was a great demo, something fell off, wasn't it? Obviously it depends how ferrous your screws are, but uh, I, I love this little mat here. So in the side of the case back here, to screw in the sort of back wall and actually bring some of the rigidity of the chassis back again, there's a couple of screws to put in on either side. You can see it sort of flaps about a little bit here because it's not screwed in. As soon as I put this screw in, it'll lock it all down. Lovely. There we go, that'll do the trick. Okay, so it's probably time to start thinking about cable management next. So in here, um, I'll do all the PCI, DV PCI devices last because they'll be easiest. But it's stuff like routing all of the SATA cables from front to back around the fan wall into the back plane area that I really want to start thinking about next. Um, I've installed the five and a quarter inch um, SATA SSD caddies into here. Obviously, oh, is, are they toolless? Oh, that's nice. And then it's just a couple of screws required on there. There are some very specific sized screws here to go into the bottom of these toolless, mostly toolless, two and a half inch drive bay caddies for the IC dock. So a pair of screws goes in the front of these. So I need to make sure I label these. And then once the screws are installed, it should just be a case of pushing it in. And then locking it in place. Yeah, love that. As easy as that to install a two and a half inch SSD. Yes, please. Okay, with a bit of basic organization taken care of, it really is time to start routing cables now. So my two boot SSDs, the DOM ports, these two orange ones, I don't really want to have to run these cables all the way over here if I can avoid it. That's quite a long run, actually. What I've done in the Rosewall case is I just have a pair of, you can, you can actually tuck, you can actually tuck in the Rosewall, you can tuck like, SSDs and things down the back of the power supply. There's just enough room. I've, I've run mine like that for the last five years and had no issues whatsoever before someone tells me they're gonna overheat back there. They've been, they've been just fine. I found my little baggie of SATA cables. I love, things like freezer bags for organizing cables this particular ikea make of all people ikea make the best freezer bags besides the the traditional ziplocs uh, although i think i actually think these probably are a little more solid this bag has been with me since london and it's still in great condition uh, but the reason i like these bags is because you can just throw all the cables inside them you don't have to really tidy them that well and then you just literally go and grab your bag of SATA cables and bring them over to where you want to go. Something else I've picked up over the years as well is to, if you can, always try and use these locking SATA cables. Sometimes the ones that come with motherboards don't have the little locking adapters on. Even actually I'm noticing my little slim SATA SFF to eight SATA breakout. The, these ones are just friction fit. And I have had on a couple of occasions the friction fit just work just a little bit loose so particularly on things like a boot drive if you can try and use the locking ones all right so i've just finishing up putting the two ssds the two boot ssds in this front corner down here and you know the access is it's tight but it's doable i think if you're going to install all four you might want to consider taking out this fan wall bracket in the middle which is held held in place with this four screws two on each side from underneath not the easiest installation. It would be kind of nice if it was like a toaster. Maybe maybe they could sell a back plane. It would be like a toaster and I just insert them like a slot. I mean, there's room 
you know, if you do a similar layout to the icy dock on the front, there's room for six or something down there, you know. But in general, it's a little fiddly to get in that front corner, but totally workable. And just like that, the build is done. I cannot tell you how nice it is to be treated like an adult by the BIOS in this thing. Let me explain what I mean. I went to enable bifurcation in the BIOS. There are multiple PCI cards in this system, and some of them need to have the PCIe slots bifurcated. What that means, as I said earlier, is you take one 16x slot and you divide it up into four. So for example, I have an ASUS M.2 card, which takes one 16x slot and lets me put four M.2 NVMe SSDs in it. To enable that to show up to the operating system as four individual drives, I need to turn on bifurcation in the BIOS to make it show up as four times four X PCIe slots. In my Intel days, I've had dual Xeons, with an LGA 2011 platform, and bifurcation was kind of okay, but it was a bit of a crapshoot, to be honest. With my consumer-grade Intel CPU, the i5-8500 that's been in my media server to date, Morpheus, that only has 16 PCIe lanes on the CPU and 20 or 24 on the chipset. And the bifurcation in there doesn't expose the granularity that I needed to do what I needed to do. In this, it was trivial. It was it was genuinely boring, which is, <laughs> let me tell you, it's the best kind of way to be in this situation. So I was like, right, I'm going to look, look up in the motherboard manual, which PCIe slot or the silk screening on the motherboard itself. Right, CPU PCIe slot six. I need that slot, for example, to be two by four slots for my two U.2 NVMe SSDs. So I go into the BIOS and enable bifurcation. I take a single 8x slot and divide it up into two 4x slots. Reboot, boom, just works. No problem whatsoever. So here I am in the BIOS and I want to enable PCIe bifurcation. So if I jump into the PCIe menu, scroll all the way down, look at this, it exposes to me individual controls for each slot. Now here I, I'm not entirely sure which slot that I, is I want to bifurcate. So I, I grab the motherboard manual and it shows me PCIe slot 2. That's the one that I put my two Intel NVMe U.2 drives in. And if I select this option here, it gives me the ability to turn a single by 8 slot into two 4x4 four four slots. And what you're seeing here is the magic of IPMI. I'm connected through a web browser seeing my full BIOS and boot process happening right in front of me. Now, the last thing that I want to do is verify that those two NVMe SSDs appear as I would hope. So I do an F disk minus L and look at that. Both of the PCIe devices have been bifurcated correctly and they just showed up. I mean, that's how easy it should be. Are you watching Intel? Another example, PCIe pass through. This is what got me interested in Linux in the first place 10 or more years ago when I was a poor student and retail worker and couldn't afford to buy two computers. PCA pass-through is notoriously picky when it comes to BIOS settings, hardware compatibility, and all the rest of it. So I thought, right, I'm going to set myself a challenge. Can I spin up a NixOS VM, pass through the NVIDIA RTX A4000 that's in there to that NixOS VM and get it working within 20 minutes? 
Yes, <laughs> yes I could. The IOMMU was enabled out of the box. I didn't have to do anything there. The IOMMU groups were perfect. Each individual group, just everything had its own individual group. No interrupt remapping or ACS downstream patches or anything like that was required. It just worked. And when I say it's boring, that's because I've spent the last decade with it being incredibly unboring and sometimes frankly, quite challenging to get it working. In this epic base system, everything, everything when it comes to PCIe devices is just, it's a dream. It's a real, it's a top tier platform. And if you're in any doubt as to whether the Epic Roam platform is gonna work for you and your use case, and you've got a couple of GPUs, a couple of NVMe SSDs, I can wholeheartedly recommend this platform for your use case. So let's talk power draw for a moment. That was one of my biggest concerns going into building this system. I'm delighted to say that at idle, just the CPU and the motherboard itself with obviously the RAM and the boot SSDs, 50 watts, 45, 50 watts or something like that, which is a lot less than I was expecting. I'm coming from my dual Xeon days where I could expect 100, 150 plus just at idle. Next, I added in the 10 gig Connect X3 SFP plus NIC that I'll be using to get 10 gig networking going in this system. It was about another 10 watts. Then I added in my Arc Pro A40 single slot GPU, another 10 watts, give or take at idle. The next thing that I added in was, yes, the NVIDIA GPU, the A4000. Now this is really interesting. At idle, with no drivers or any kind of power management enabled, the A4000 drew about 40 to 45 watts doing absolutely nothing. And that meant the whole back area of the case there got really kind of warm. So I had to install another Noctua fan just at the back there just to get some more airflow going through. I've got three 120 mil fans here right in the middle, but I wasn't quite able to get enough airflow with just those alone. However, I'm pleased to report you know that Nix OS VM I mentioned a moment ago. As soon as I enabled the PCIe power management for the NVIDIA cards in Nix OS, the idle power usage of that NVIDIA GPU dropped from 42 watts to eight watts. Yes, that's right, eight watts at idle. Oh, what a dream. The next thing to add in were the two U.2 NVMe PCIe SSDs along with the um, ASUS Hyper 16X four NVMe M.2 SSD cards, so two PCIe cards were added. Those added about 30 watts, give or take, to the system total. And then at the front, the business end, 10 spinning hard drives, those added about 60 watts, give or take. And so if you've been keeping score at this point, we're at approximately 175 watts. I've been using this kilowatt here to measure the power. I, I don't know how accurate it is, but all the measurements were taken with this device here. And the benchmark I'd set myself was to get as close to 100 watts as I could, which was never going to happen with all of this hardware in this case. The reason I set 100 watts is because my previous server has an iGPU, so I don't need a PCIe graphics card in there to do quick sync transcoding. It had just the same number of hard drives, but it had way less PCIe devices in there. So that thing, Morpheus, idled at approximately 100 watts. So I was thinking, oh, come on, how close can I get to that with, with this server here? 175 watts, given the fact that this is a 24 core, 48 thread monster system with 256 gigabytes of ECC memory in it, not to mention the 10 hard drives, the three two and a half inch SSDs at the front, the, what is it, four M.2 SSDs, another two U.2 SSDs, two GPUs, 10 gig networking, and an HBA card as well. Frankly, the fact that this comes in at 175 watts, it just blows my absolute little tiny brain to pieces. This server is, it's, I cannot really explain to you how pleased I am at the outcome of this. The power usage is way better than I expected. The usability of all the PCIe stuff is way better and easier and more reliable than I expected. The only downside perhaps is the cost. It's not crazy, for what you get, but it's also not what you'd call cheap. So I paid $1,700 for this CPU and motherboard combo from a Chinese eBay seller called TUGM, I'll put a link to him in the, in the description down below, for an eBay listing, which came with the CPU cooler that you see in here as well. I ordered over Chinese New Year, and the shipping times, frankly, were, were totally reasonable considering, it was about two weeks. 
I've had buddies order from this same seller though, and it takes a matter of days. It's air freight shipped out. And even when my buddy had an issue with some of the surface mount components being physically damaged on his motherboard, the seller just cross shipped him a new one, a couple of days, no problem. It's not often I bother recommending an eBay seller to people, but this one in particular is worth your attention. Now, a couple of other things to think about. The Probably one of the biggest issues I've found so far are the two U.2 drives. Those are sandwiched in between a GPU and the uh, Asus 4x uh, M.2 PCIe card. Those U.2 discs get pretty warm, actually pretty toasty. We're talking sort of 60, 65 Celsius under load. So what I'm thinking about doing is taking one of the five and a quarter inch bays here at the front of the case and ordering some kind of a cage or chassis. I think IC Doc make one and then I can just front load the U.2 discs in there and get some cool fresh air in the front straight over those U.2 drives so that that really congested PCIe area at the back there has just a little less heat to deal with. Finally, I want to touch on an area that has been a problem for me with super micro motherboards for years, and that is fan control. It can be really tricky to get them to play nicely with Noctua fans specifically because they spin so slowly. So what happens normally is the Noctua fans idle at about 400, 450 RPM. The BMC can't comprehend that a fan would spin so slowly and then it goes, there must be a critical failure. So it ramps the fans all the way up to 100% and then gradually brings them back down and the cycle repeats. So I found a script, which I'll put a link to in the description down below, a Python script, which monitors the CPU temperature and uses raw IPMI tools to monitor and control the fan speed and keep the thresholds exactly where you want them. So I found a nice sweet spot is roughly 20 to 25%, something like that. That's not too loud when I'm in here in my room, you know, tinkering away. In the basement, I'll probably just turn up a bit because it's a basement. That's kind of the point. I don't care. But if you're living with this inside a house, you will hear it even with not two fans. The amount, just the sheer amount of PCIe devices back there dictate that you're going to have to have some decent airflow pushing through the case. So how did the case do? Well, I'm gonna do a full video review of the case because I've, I've got some thoughts on it. Overall, it's pretty good, actually. For the $400 price point, the, the build quality is fantastic. It knocks the Rosewell out of the park. There are literally a couple of sharp edges, nothing too crazy. And probably my biggest complaint with it is how the back plane here, I, I kind of, I'm reluctant to call it a back plane even. I mentioned that earlier in the video. It's just those pass-through SATA SAS connectors literally screwed directly into the metal at the back here, which means you have to cable up the drives individually yourself. Frankly, there isn't much room in here. I can just about get my fist in there. And then I, I actually move the fan wall back a, a slot. It, there's two there's two positions the fan wall can occupy. I moved it back a little bit just to give myself just a little bit more room. Um, that's probably the biggest drawback of this case. One thing that Sliger could do to fix that is to modify the included SATA power cables to be custom length. I mean, they know what the spacing is, right? I know it's gonna add a little bit more cost or even have a, a button that says, you know, connect me to cable mod who will do the exact spacing on the 10 power connectors that I want here. Something like that would, would actually go a long way to making this quite a lot better. The other thing that I also mentioned earlier is maybe the SSD mount here, if it was vertical or something else, you can get a bit creative with this space here. There is a lot of space to work with, but overall really quite a fantastic case. I will be working on some other videos over the next few weeks on things like how I'm going to be using NixOS for testing. I might be putting perfect media server on top of NixOS. No promises, but I am, I am working on flake for that exact purpose right now. And there's going to be a bunch of stuff with like self-hosted, AI, like the Olama stuff, machine learning. This box is gonna unlock a lot of potential for me and I've got some data to move around. I've got a couple of spare disks that I've kind of rotated in and out uh, throughout this whole process, but I am really just delighted it's done, <laughs> first of all, because it probably took me about eight, nine, 10 hours yesterday, including the filming, I suppose. So that, I mean, I guess it could have been a little bit less if I wasn't filming, but still the, the biggest issue was just putting the cables in here. That really did take me quite a long time to get everything lined up just as I wanted. I'll also be giving some more thoughts on the self-hosted podcast at selfhosted.show. And until next time, I've been Alex from KTZ Systems.